Before we get to today's episode, I want to recommend a podcast I've been listening to that I think listeners of this show might find interesting. It's The History of Vikings, hosted by Noah Tetzner, and available wherever you get your podcasts. This is a great show featuring conversations with leading historians about Viking history, Norse mythology, the history of medieval Scandinavia more generally. Some recent episodes have included King Harold Bluetooth of Bluetooth fame, ghosts and zombie stories from the Viking Age, weapons and battle tactics, the history of the Vikings in Russia, and most recently, a whole interview about the holiday of Yule, the Norse winter holiday. It's a great show, and Noah's a fantastic interviewer, so if you're at all interested in the subject matter, I highly encourage you to check out the history of Vikings wherever you listen to this or any other podcast. And now, on with the show. Hello. The episode you're about to listen to is part of a multi-part series introducing an overview of Japanese history. This is a repeat of one of the original projects the History of Japan podcast was built on, and is intended to serve as an update and supplement to these original works. After 10 years, my hope is to return to this approach and to do it a little bit better given the skills that I have improved in the intervening years. If you haven't been doing so already, you should listen to these episodes sequentially, starting with episode 501. Without any further ado, enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the History of Japan podcast, episode 514, The Structure of Medieval Japan. Today I want to put a pin in our narrative of the chronology of Japanese history to turn our attention to an important and related but distinct subject. We generally refer to the Kamakura Bakfu, the Hojo government that we've been talking about for the last few episodes, as the beginning of Japan's medieval era, and so we should take some time to talk about what that change means what's different enough about medieval Japan to make it, well, medieval? The answer begins with a return to a discussion we've had before, regarding the shōen, or tax-free estate. As a quick refresher, shōen estates were initially created as a means to provide religious institutions with support and to encourage private investment into the expensive and difficult process of clearing more of Japan's mountainous land for agricultural cultivation. Shōen lands, once granted, became in essence a permanent source of income for their holders, who did not pay taxes from the Shōen to the central government, and who instead could collect taxes to sustain themselves from those working the Shōen lands. This is an arrangement that obviously greatly benefits the holder of the Shōen, particularly because the rights are perpetual, meaning they do not ever expire and can be handed down to your descendants. You also did not need to manage your shōen in person, you could always pay a local manager to do that for you, and simply have them forward you the profits as you resided somewhere else, almost always Kyoto or its surrounding environs. There was also no limit on the number of shōen an individual, family, or institution could hold. Competition for the control of shōen thus became very fierce, and in many ways it was this system of tax-free holdings that created the unique governing structure of medieval Japan. This was a structure where multiple different centers of power, kenmon to use a term we've used in previous episodes of this series, such as the imperial family, powerful aristocratic families in Kyoto, temples and shrines, and now the various warrior families, including the shogunate, held their own shōen. The shōen provided the wealth for these independent kenmon groups to operate and also justified the existence of and paid the financial cost for, maintaining independent military forces to protect their land rights. The proliferation of shōen, by the late Heian era accounting for somewhere between 40 and 60% of all taxable land, also substantially weakened the central government in Kyoto, which had a harder and harder time meeting its own projected tax revenues using the ever-decreasing amount of kokugaryo, public land that was open to taxation. This was a particular problem for the kokushi, provincial governors appointed by the Kyoto government to manage one of Japan's 60 provinces, 
and whose main job was to meet the projected tax revenue for their tenure in office however they could. In some provinces, this was harder than others. Noto province, now southern Ishikawa prefecture next to the Sea of Japan, had over 70% of its paddy lands converted into shōen by the 1200s. Given the immense value of the shōen, particularly in a country where the economy was still overwhelmingly based on agriculture, it's not terribly surprising these estates were worth fighting over, and during the medieval era, new contenders in the contest for their wealth emerged, the shugo and the jito. These two positions collectively represented one of the most important concessions wrested from the civilian government by the Kamakura Bakufu during its ascension to power. The shugo, theoretically, were military counterparts to the civilian kokushi governors who oversaw Japan's 60 provinces. They were supposed to handle issues of concern to the samurai class within the provinces, and keep order among the fractious warrior families, who could be violently jealous of each other's power and prestige. Jito, meanwhile, were stewards appointed to individual pieces of land, often, but not always, shōen estates. In both cases, the goal was theoretically similar. The shugo and jito were intended to represent the interests of the samurai class, and maintain order within the territory they'd been charged with, be it a whole province or a specific estate. The reality, of course, was not quite so straightforward. It's not entirely clear to us what the relationship was between the Shugo and the Shoen estates. Among other things, Shoen could not be entered by government agents without the permission of the Shoen holder. Did that same rule apply to a Shugo whose job included tracking down wanted criminals? It's not entirely clear from the historical record, and we certainly do have documented instances of shōen holders resisting shugo interference in their affairs. It's also pretty clear to us that the vast majority of shugo at this point did not bother taking up residence in the areas they were supposed to be assigned to, particularly if these were remote provinces. After all, if you were given the job of shugo of, say, Io province in remote Shikoku, well, that was very nice and prestigious, but actually going there meant removing yourself from Kyoto and Kamakura, the two places to be in terms of both culture and your personal political influence. Thus, at this point, Shugo are more important for us in terms of the precedent they helped to set, that samurai should have some influence over affairs at the provincial level, than for their immediate effectiveness in terms of actually governing the provinces, which was questionable at best. The Jito, on the other hand, are a very different story, and one that's very hard to tell because of how varied that story can be. The role of the Jito, again, was to manage warrior affairs in a given localized area, often but not always defined by a specific shōen. And the charge of the Jito was both broadly empowering and extremely vague. Their appointments were permanent and in perpetuity, revocable only by the Kamakura Bakufu, and not at all answerable to the Shōen estate holder or their deputies. In theory, Jito were supposed to obey local precedents in terms of how they exercised their powers, but those precedents were often not well documented and left at any rate for the Jito themselves to figure out. This arrangement, a rather broadly defined job to maintain order and a complete independence from the existing arrangement of power in the shōen, made for, let's call it, a heady political cocktail. And indeed, the historical record's pretty clear that from the jump, Jito clashed often with existing power holders wherever they were assigned, which is actually why we know so much more about them compared to the shugo. A good chunk of the Kamakura Bakufu's time and energy, especially early in its history, was devoted to dealing with legal disputes between Jito and Shōen holders, or between neighboring Jito. The sheer number of problems an independent-minded Jito could create meant that a lot of paperwork, very useful to modern historians, was generated in the process of trying to keep them under some semblance of control. As an interesting aside, the position of Jito was not a gendered one. It could be inherited by both men and women, and Jito titles were not combined by a marital family unless that was explicitly agreed to as part of a marriage. In other words, a wife could pass hers down, 
separately from her husband's. This didn't really begin to change until the Mongol invasions. Women in the warrior class certainly contributed to the war effort against the Mongols, but few fought on the front lines, and the shogunate explicitly condemned this fact, ordering in 1286 that women no longer inherit landed titles in Kyushu until the threat of a third invasion had permanently passed, for fear that it would need to marshal another army on the island and not have enough fighting men to do so. Families that held land on Kyushu without a male heir were ordered to adopt one immediately. That order was never rescinded, but it was also not consistently followed. Enforcing such things in remote Kyushu was difficult, and very few local families were terribly keen to adopt new heirs who were not necessarily loyal to the family interests, just because the shogunate said you had to. Still, this was the beginning of an official clampdown on female inheritance within the samurai class. Alongside shifts in inheritance patterns, which we'll talk more about in a second, this was the beginning of a shift for warrior women into a distinctly second-class status. And as another aside, I do also want to note that while women don't appear much on the front line of battle at this time, there is evidence to suggest that women of the warrior class did fight. Of course, the example of Tomoe Gozen, a minor character in the Heike Monogatari, who is depicted as a follower of Minamoto no Yoshinaka, and who does some pretty badass stuff before riding into the sunset, is very illustrative. Though it is unclear, as with so much of Heike Monogatari, how fictionalized her story is. Similarly, there's an offhand reference in court documents from the Nanbokcho Wars, about which more in a few weeks, to a female cavalry. Unfortunately, however, said document says nothing else about them. During the wars of the 1500s, there are plenty of accounts of women fighting, primarily to defend their homesteads while their men were away on campaign. For example, one witness to the siege of Amakusa Castle in 1589 said the women of the castle fought back so fiercely that, quote, they filled the moat with the bodies they slew. Anyway, all of this is interesting, bit beside the point, Suffice it to say, both men and women had the ability to inherit these titles during the Kamakura period, and defended their ability to do so. You see, regardless of their relative levels of power, the positions of both Shugo and Jito were very coveted for a simple reason. It might seem a bit counterintuitive, but it's worth remembering at this point, the warrior class is not that sharply delineated. The samurai are not a distinct social category in the way they will be in later years. Before the Kamakura period, warriors were also local officials, tax collectors, and anything else they had to be to make a living. They were also dependent on the continued goodwill of local officials or employers in the various estates to keep their jobs. One of the main ways Minamoto no Yoritomo and his immediate successors in the Kamakura Bakfu won followers was by promising, in essence, job security, with the positions of Shugo and Jito functionally lifetime tenures, dependent only on the goodwill of the shogun, being one of the main ways they satisfied this bargain. However, even with these new positions, the issue of satisfying warrior demand for land never really went away, and in retrospect, this would become a key structural weakness of the Kamakura Bakfu, and a major contributor to its eventual downfall. As I'm going to keep saying for a while, the economy of Japan at this point is mostly agrarian, meaning that land rights are the main way a person makes money. Thus, when Minamoto no Yoritomo and his successors took it on themselves to organize the warriors of eastern Japan into a coherent political force, one of the main demands of these warriors was for more land. And early on, satisfying that demand was not that hard. Yoritomo himself could redistribute lands from the defeated Taira and his other various foes, and his successors had no shortage of chances to do the same. For example, both the crushing of the Hiki clan by the Hojo in the first decade of the 1200s, and Emperor Go-Daigo's Jokyu Rebellion in 1221, saw massive redistributions of land to pro-Hojo families once the shogunate won out. However, over time, that sort of redistribution became harder to manage for the simple fact that military challenges to the shogunate became rarer and rarer. The last serious rebellion against the shogunate, at least for a while, was in 1247 by a retainer family called the Miura, 
who hoped to forge an alliance with the Kyoto court to challenge the Hojo. After their defeat, opportunities to crush a military challenge and thus redistribute land to favored retainers were fewer and further between, and new medieval farming technologies had reached their limit in terms of bringing more land under cultivation. You might be asking, why is there this insatiable demand for more and more land among the warriors of Kamakura? At what point would enough be enough? Are these people just very greedy? Well, yeah, I think some of them are, but also this is a matter of politics. Each successive generation of leaders within the Kamakura Bakufu needed favors to give out to win support, after all. Imagine that you were a young new Hojo Shiken who's just come to power. You could rely on good policy and pure charisma to convince people to follow you, and that's all well and good, but every so often you might need a more of a traditional incentive, let's call it. More important than sheer political bribery, though, was the issue of inheritance practice. Before the 1300s, it was actually pretty uncommon for warrior families, or anyone else, to engage in primogeniture, the inheritance of family assets by the eldest male heir. Instead, from what we can tell, assets appear to have been split between all children, often, but not always, including daughters. Which was very forward-thinking and all, but it did mean the estates of these powerful families were constantly fragmenting and needed to be replenished. Eventually, this would result in a shift towards primogeniture and single male heirs for families, but that shift would take a while, both because changing social norms always does take time, and because potential heirs would naturally enough have some feelings on this issue, and a single heir being a single person meant that barring some serious family tragedies, there were always going to be more people invested in fighting this shift than supporting it. In the shorter term, warrior families tried to stop gap measures, for example, lifetime inheritances that would go to children other than the oldest male and revert to the family line after death, but in general, warrior families were constantly losing income due to the inheritance system. The constant battles for wealth also shaped the nature of warrior society during the Kamakura period. They were also a big part, for example, of why the Jito position could be such a legal mess. More than a few families who inherited Jito titles tried to make up for shortages in income created by their inheritances by keeping more taxes from the estates they were guarding than they were supposed to. Since Jito didn't answer to estate owners directly, there wasn't a lot estate owners could do about this. Their only recourse was to complain to the shogun in Kamakura, enacting a lengthy and complicated series of court battles which would take years to resolve, and which the shogunate often had a hard time enforcing anyway. Some Jito families even took up banditry when they lost a court case against an estate holder, in essence continuing to collect taxes and daring the government to stop them, Rarely, if ever, were they actually stopped. All of this meant that land rights and wealth were an increasingly contentious subject during the Kamakura period, and as we mentioned last week, the great victories against the Mongols didn't add more land or wealth to redistribute either, so paying back warrior families for their service often involved dipping into the shogunate's own reserves. And that's a dangerous situation to be in. Remember, the warriors of eastern Japan followed Minamoto no Yoritomo not largely out of personal allegiance, but because of the practical promises he made them. Join me and we can become a political force to be reckoned with, and that force can be wielded to protect your interests and your wealth. If the Kamakura government no longer guaranteed great rewards for its followers in the way it once had, maybe it was not as useful as it once had been. When we look, starting in the next couple of weeks, at the rapid collapse of the Kamakura government, I think this will be important to keep in mind. As we consider explanations for why this government collapsed so rapidly in the face of a military challenge from the seemingly defanged Kyoto government, it's important for us not to ignore, in many ways, the most obvious explanation. The Kamakura government collapsed because its most important constituents stopped seeing the value or point of it. But of course, warrior interests are not the only important part of this period, and I want to leave the samurai where they are for a bit to turn our attention to another subject. The lives of, well, more or less everyone else. 
We have been dealing mostly with the lives of warriors, aristocrats, and priests, but these people were a comparatively tiny fraction of Japan's population, which, by the way, was estimated by the year 1000 to be somewhere between 5.6 and 7 million people. For comparative purposes, the higher of those numbers, 7 million people, is about half the population of Tokyo proper today, 14 million, which, by the way, is just Tokyo proper, the 23 wards of the city, not the greater metro area. That's quite a bit bigger. Anyway, all of that is to say our focus has primarily been on a tiny fraction of a comparatively much smaller population than what exists today. And there's a good reason for that, of course. Literacy. Literacy in Japan, as everywhere else, was far from universal before the advent of modern public education, and in particular during the medieval era, literacy was not common at all. Only those who could afford an education, which really is to say the upper levels of the samurai class and the Kyoto aristocracy, reliably knew how to read and write. Those who made it into the Buddhist priesthood would usually learn too. After all, you had to know how to read a sutra to chant a sutra. But that group too represents a fairly small substrate of society. Meanwhile, the vast majority of Japan's population at this time belonged to a different group, the farmers. Our knowledge of the medieval peasantry is limited, to say the least. It would not be for a few more centuries yet that literacy would begin to penetrate substantially into the countryside. In the written record, which represents the single greatest collection of sources available to any historian, medieval peasants appear rarely, and when they do, it's pretty much always through the eyes of other social classes who didn't have particularly high opinions of them. In addition, those records almost entirely dealt with subjects of dispute, primarily in relation to land and taxes. From what we can tell, most of the interaction of peasants in the countryside with the literate elites of the cities revolved around issues of taxation. Those owed taxes complained they weren't getting enough. Those paying taxes complained that too much was asked of them. And that skews our perception even further, because if we listen to the written record, Legal battles with Shoan proprietors and local warriors over their produce was the secondary vocation of all farmers after farming itself. That's probably not representative of how they spent all their time, and given the ones collecting taxes are the ones writing these records, those records are also not super favorable to the peasants, often depicting them as duplicitous cheaters more interested in avoiding their justly owed taxes than anything else. And this separation between the peasants and the elites who writing history would actually grow over time. Recall that most aristocrats and elite warriors were drawing income from Shoan estates during this period, but doing so didn't require actually living on the estate. The vast majority of estate proprietors farmed the job of actually running the place out to locals called Shoken, who did the actual managing and forwarded the profits onto the owners, minus their take. All of this meant that the people writing most of the historical record would, in most cases, never actually even see a peasant except maybe from afar on a pilgrimage route or something like that. There's also the confusing fact that during this period, written records don't actually distinguish much between farming and other non-elite professions. For example, there was no legal distinction between a farmer living on a show-in and a local merchant who might move between several neighboring show and estates to make a living. Nor was there any special system to tax the transactions of this merchant. They were treated as part of a farming family and owed taxes based on the size of their family and their family lands, not on their success as a merchant. Similarly, produce, like fish or salt or what have you, would be assessed in an equivalent value of rice, which was very gameable as a system in an age before modern commodity markets and made it even easier to cheat tax collectors. Which, of course, is great if you're a local trying to avoid paying your taxes, but it makes our job as historians quite a bit harder when we're trying to figure out what was going on. We're not entirely reliant on traditional written records, to be sure. One famous example is an emaki, or illustrated scroll, depicting the life of the founder of Pure Land Buddhism, Honen, the Honen Shonin Eden. The monk Honen, you might recall, was exiled from Kyoto at one point during his career due to concerns about the unorthodox teachings of the Pure Land sect. This scroll includes a depiction of his time in the countryside 
preaching to the locals while they're farming. He himself is the focal point of the scene while the farmers do the work of transplanting rice seedlings into paddy fields. Men are shown preparing the fields while women work behind them transplanting the seedlings, with some percussionists equipped with drums and a rattle providing an accompaniment, presumably as a way to keep time and keep spirits up during this difficult work. This specific scene is pretty famous, it's actually the basis for the farming scene at the end of Kurosawa Akira's epic film The Seven Samurai, where it symbolizes the bonds of village life and the return to peace, but there's no way of knowing whether it's an accurate depiction of the division of farm labor. After all, the artist here was interested in depicting Honen. They could have just made the rest of the scene up altogether. What we're left with, then, is an attempt to read out the history of the vast majority of Japan's population from the margins of the written record itself, reconstructing what we can from offhanded and fragmentary references. And mind you, that situation is not unique to Japan at all. Indeed, around the world, there's been a real interest in the last few decades in trying to do similar work. For the exact same reasons, around much of the world, the written record overwhelmingly favors the elite and educated. In Japan specifically, the picture that emerges when you begin to do this work is fascinating, because it implies peasants were way more organized than their elite counterparts gave them credit for. For example, a 1334 record of Niimi estate near modern Okayama in western Japan provides a fascinating window into tax collection. That record was assembled by a monk named Jinson, whose temple owned the estate and who was charged with ensuring taxes from it were being properly collected. Jinson's records include all the information you'd usually need, but they also provide a fascinating window into rural life. For example, one of the expenses listed for the estate is a New Year's banquet thrown by the estate manager, to which every peasant of the estate was invited. Given how this is treated as, in essence, a business expense, this seems to have been a social expectation for all estate owners. Similarly, the document makes reference to market dwellings, primarily in the context of taxation as those market dwellings have fields attached to them from which taxes are to be collected. However, this gives us a clue that even a small estate like Niimi had its own markets, which in turn implies regular trade with neighboring estates. Fragments like this give us a hint of what was happening in the provinces, but they are just that, fragments. Unfortunately, a better understanding of life in the provinces would have to wait a few more centuries yet. However, more broadly, we can look at the economy of medieval Japan and make some interesting inferences. And I do have to emphasize here too we are reliant on inference. The historical record is not as thorough when it comes to, say, the spread of coinage or the growth of commodity markets, as it is when it comes to wars and succession disputes. At any rate, those sorts of innovations lack hard and fast dates associated with them in quite the same way that a war, for example, has a definitive beginning and an end. Still, there are distinct shifts in the economy we can observe over the course of the medieval era, even if we can't pinpoint exactly when they took place. All of this still gives us a valuable illustration of how much was changing and how quickly. For starters, it's pretty clear that agricultural productivity did begin to expand over the course of the Kamakura Shogunate, and especially during the 1300s during the successive government we'll talk more about in future episodes. In other words, while bringing new lands under cultivation, the traditional way of growing the agricultural economy, was harder to do than ever, the lands that were already being cultivated were becoming more efficient. There were a few reasons why. One of the biggest is the import of a new strand of rice, the so-called champa rice from the continent. Originally from what's now Vietnam, this strain of rice is much more drought-resistant and hardy, and tends to mature much more quickly than other variants. It was introduced to China sometime in the Song Dynasty, so about a thousand years ago, and arrived in Japan a few centuries later. The second big shift was a series of improvements in irrigation. If you've ever seen a rice paddy, you know they take a lot of water to maintain. In prior centuries, Japanese farmers relied on natural irrigation to do this, but by the medieval period they developed new techniques to make irrigation easier and more consistent. One of the biggest was the development of artificial reservoirs to control irrigation, including saucer ponds, as they were called, designed to collect runoff from rainwater and use it to irrigate fields. 
These improvements, plus the growing availability of draft animals and the discovery of double cropping, planting twice on the same field in a year by relying on crops that matured in different seasons, meant agricultural productivity began to explode in the countryside during the medieval era. And importantly, very little of that increased productivity was successfully taxed by show and estate holders, provincial governors, or anyone else. For starters, tax rates were fixed at a certain amount per field, and the assumptions that amount was based upon were rooted in earlier and less productive farming methods. In addition, remember, most show and estate holders were absentee landlords, and even a provincial governor didn't really go wandering around the countryside surveying the landscape personally. In addition, the Kamakura shogunate actually forbade members of the warrior class, who did live in the countryside, from taxing the second harvest of peasants, not out of kindness, mind you, but because of worries around famine. So it was comparatively easy to keep the benefits of this growing productivity within farming communities, and that in turn led to a big shift in the nature of the Japanese economy. Because, well, imagine, if you have more of something than you really need, what are you going to want to do with it? The answer, of course, is sell it. And so in the countryside, you see the beginning of a proliferation of local markets, as hinted at, for example, in the records of the Niimi Shoen we talked about just a second ago. Local markets are not new to Japan during this period, there are scattered references to local markets going as far back as the Nara period, but they were comparatively small in number with most of the economy, from what we can see at least, being run through the center of power in Kyoto. The medieval economy, by contrast, was, like almost everything else in medieval Japan, way more decentralized, with growing trade not just between the provinces in Kyoto, but within the provinces themselves. And, unlike past eras, this economy was mediated by a growing new form of exchange, currency. Now, there had been attempts by past Japanese governments to mint their own coinage as far back as the pre-Nara years, but for various reasons we don't really have time for here, that never really took off. The biggest reason, if you're curious, was simply that, because most of the economy revolved around shipping goods from the provinces to Kyoto, coins were just not that useful. So Japanese coinage would fall off in usage and didn't really return until the 1590s. Instead, it was foreign coins, especially currency brought from China's Song Dynasty, that formed the backbone of the economy. These Chinese coins were very valuable and there was such demand for them in Japan as the rural economy grew that the Song Dynasty eventually placed a not very successful ban on the export of coins to Japan. Song Dynasty coinage remained the main medium of exchange until the 1500s. The upshot of all of this was the emergence of provincial market towns, the beginning of urbanization outside of Kyoto and Kamakura. These early market towns were generally built on the grounds of a local Buddhist temple, both because the temples attracted pilgrims as visitors, and because their influence could shield the market from interference by local warriors and officials. There was also a belief these temples could spiritually cleanse an item, so to speak, of attachment to its former owner, preventing any unfortunate spiritual pollution from following an item to its new owner. These market towns would become increasingly important to Japan's economic and cultural life as they continued to grow, becoming home, for example, to the nation's first trade guilds and to growing numbers of professional artisans and merchants. They remained, for the time, comparatively small in scale, but particularly by the 1400s, their importance would balloon dramatically. But we're not there yet. That's all for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This show is a part of the Facing Backwards Network. You can find out more about this show and our other shows at facingbackward.com, and you can support the network at patreon.com slash facingbackward. Special thanks to those who have given at our shout-out tier, Yan Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostocker, Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Karen Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prine, William Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Rushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Cat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, and Anonymous Anna's Hummingbird, Mark Sai, Gill, Leslie Ikuta, Trash Taste Enjoyer, Harrison Reese, Robbie Martin McAvoy, Inoue Enrio's Ghostbusters, Nihongo Kaisen.com, Shimao Toshio's History of Yaponesia Podcast, 
A house is a perfectly cromulent mascot. The fish I catch are Rhodes scholars compared to Samuel Alito, schmuck, and everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Thanks again for listening to this, the final episode of 2023. I'm going to take next week off for New Year's, so we'll be back in two weeks' time to cover the end of the Kamakura government and the rise of what comes next. Thank you again for listening, have a happy new year, and I'll see you in 2024.